Now it's time for some, in fact, let me just check sound. You'll like this, Josh, I'm actually checking the sound this week. Paranoid, I think it sounds good. Hi, and welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show this week, we have a look at that new Fazari Signal Peak cross-country bike, really nice that is. Uh, also the Hope Technology HB916 High Pivot Enduro Bike. There's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, very cool stuff. Uh, there's also a brand new Airshock from uh, none of the big guns involved in the suspension world, actually. So this is kind of a cool thing. And it's got some really cool top mods from you lovely lot. Okay, so into the show and this week's topic, well, let's talk a little bit about industry standards and what we think might be the next industry standard, or rather, what you think might be the next industry standard out there. Now, even though it's standard, it's actually a bit of a joke when it comes to mountain biking because we've had so many of them over the years and all ironically using the term industry standard. Well, why is that? Well, probably because the fact the mountain bike is not that old and it's grown immensely fast. And one of the reasons it's done that is because it can borrow technology, concepts, ideas from so many other places, which is why I believe mountain biking is, is the best thing out there. Um, obviously I'm biased in thinking that, but think about what it can do. It can borrow from motorsports, it can borrow from the rest of the cycling world, it can take concepts from skiing, snowboarding, mountain sports, outdoors, it's just, it can borrow from so many cool areas and utilize technology in a different way. So I think it's really cool. And as a result, that's why where we are today, there's so much cool stuff. But let's skip back to the beginning a minute when we all had 26 inch wheels. So without even talking about the wheel size debate that we've changed, there's a whole other bunch of standards that have changed over the years. Uh, the first one I can think of is a steerer tube on a bike, which once upon a time, they were all steel. They were all made from, um, made from steel. Uh, they were all one inch and they were threaded. Uh, then after a while, Gary Fisher introduced the 1.25 evolution size, which was bigger. And then we settled on 1.125, which was slightly smaller. Uh, that's inch and eighth to you and me. Uh, which later on became the threadless system, which was a much better industry standard to be fair. It was losing weight, it was simplifying the headset, everything about it was better than that clunky old rubbish that's gone. Thank you, uh, threadless steerer tubes. But anyway, after a while, we went from inch and an eighth, so the 1.125 inch there, all the way up to 1.5, which was just a monumental difference. Like we're talking like a difference in 26 inch wheels to 29. When it came out, people were like retorting, oh my God, this is hideous. Uh, but what it enabled bike designers to do was develop things like the Manitou Sherman, the RockShox Totem. Do you remember these big, long travel, single crown forks? Incredible, and actually, I think a bit of a look at the future. Now, unfortunately, it was just a little bit too big, a little bit too stiff, frame design just looked ugly with those things on the front. Uh, but thankfully, we wound it back a bit, and we had the tapered system, which is what we have as a standard today. Uh, 1.125 or an uh, inch and eighth at the top, tapering to 1.5 at the bottom. After all, the bottom where all the lever is going through the frame and the headset there uh, is where you need the bigger support. And at the top, arguably, you don't. So uh, the best of both worlds. Um, and then, of course, going with that, headset standards. Now, there used to be so many of these, it was just harmful trying to just think about the tools you need and which system you needed for your bike and which cup was different at the bottom, bottom and the top. Forget them all. Uh, at the moment, we're pretty much finalizing on using angular contact bearings, top and bottom, uh, split steerer tube rings there that just go over with no tooling onto your steerer tube of the fork. So from a maintenance perspective, uh, for, for everyone viewing this show, you don't need specialist tools. When the bearings get knackered, you drop in the fresh ones with some grease, job done. And that is exactly the sort of thing we're looking for uh, with standards. Handlebars are another thing that have changed. Uh, so once upon a time, they used to be inch size, and then they went up to 31.8, of course. They used to be 25.4. They went up to 31.8, and that was almost laughed at at the time. Then went up to 35 mil. Um, but I've got to say, not that much of a fan of 35 mil. I've got a set of 35 mil bars over there. I've got a set of 31.8s in the same bars, and to me, they feel almost identical. Don't get me wrong, I've ridden some uh, 35 mil bars that have been way too stiff. You know, and some people will want that, but I've ridden uh, more bars that are stiffer than I have the 31.8 bars that have been uh, too flexible. That just doesn't really happen. So 31.8, I'm happy with. They look good on the front of a bike. They look nice and neat. I really don't see the reasoning for a 35, other than to make them fit in with the bigger front ends that you are seeing on e-bikes and some other bikes. Uh, aesthetically pleasing, I guess. Um, don't really have an issue there, but if I could pick one, I'd just probably settle on 31.8. And seat post standards. Oh, we've had a few of those over the years. Now, older steel frames used to have any number of bizarre sizes available, uh, but then it sort of streamlined down to 27.2, 30.9, 31.6, uh, 
Uh, and as we're seeing on some bikes, uh, the bigger size, 34.9. Now, the 34.9, you could argue that with dropper posts, it's a better size. Because of the fact, one of the problems that makes dropper posts so difficult to uh, not necessarily maintain, but to make them maintain a level of uh, not having to service them, making them reliable as such, is the size of the components on the inside. Trying to fit all that in a 27.2 post, you're going to run into problems. It's going to be really difficult to do. Trying to fit all that in a much bigger diameter post, you're going to get a more reliable seat post. So, from that respect, and the fact that everyone is uh, swaying towards dropper posts in the off road world, I mean, why wouldn't you? It's got to be a good thing. Uh, but there is a slight downside to it. that certain frames out there are going to be too stiff with 34.9 uh, big seat tube on the frame there. And I hear some of you groaning saying, oh, the engineers can design the frame with less in it. But really, I see nothing wrong with 31.6, so I would probably stick with that. But I'm um, keen to know what you think on that one, uh, especially anyone that is an engineer or anyone that does make bikes down below. Um, but I'd probably stick with 31.6 myself. And what we're likely to see, uh, probably that 1.8 inch steerer tube standard, so that's the bottom going from 1.5 up to 1.8. Um, we're going to definitely see that on more e-bikes. It makes sense to have the bigger supported forks um, supported, basically. Uh, but we'll probably see that on more longer travel single crown bikes as well at some point. I really hope we don't see more super boost. There's a standard I could just be living without. We just don't really need the back end to be especially wider for a nominal amount of benefit. It really doesn't add up to me. Uh, but what would I like to see? I'd like to see less frames of press fit bottom brackets. Nothing wrong with press fit bottom brackets. It's all about how you get them into the frame. And let's face it, not everyone is going to be doing it correctly because you haven't necessarily got expensive presses and things to put them in there. A bottom bracket tool is a simple tool to buy and you can use them with a vise at home or you can use it with anything else that will grab. I said a vise, bit of a joke trying to spin your bike around in a vise, but you could do that. Adjustable spanners, pair of nipex, locking plies, doesn't matter what you use. Um, one of those just makes sense for most people. It's a simple thing for manufacturers to include in the frame and it's simple to replace your bottom bracket. Um, just, just stay with threaded, it makes more sense. SRAM's open source universal derailleur hanger. Thank you SRAM for bringing that to the table. Uh, can everyone just use it already? Like, that makes sense, why would you not? Go to the bike shop, the broken derailleur hanger. There you go, I'll have one of those, done. Might have to look at a sheet with about 50 of them on there, it just makes no sense. Internal routing on frames or internal routing, depending on where you're from viewing this, surely all of them should have internal routing channels on there. You know, you feed the hose in, it comes out the other end, done. No fannying around, uh, the cable tapping and not coming out the tube and having a swear in a workshop, all of that, just get it done. And also one other that I really like that I've seen on a few frames, not all frames, that granted doesn't necessarily make sense for a wider appeal, but I kind of like it anyway. Think about the, um, the post mount where you mount your brakes on a bike. If you manage to strip those threads out, that's a bit of a problem because of uh, you know the, the torque you have to have on that bolt anyway is securing your brake on. Arguably, you could write off a frame. I've seen some manufacturers, off the top of my head, white bikes do this. They use captive nuts in there. So if you strip them, you just replace the nut. Super simple, um, a really great approach. And I love the, the fact that it makes your frame last longer. Um, even with those of us who've got club hands when you're trying to fix stuff with hammers and bits of wood. So I think that's a good thing. But um, I'd love to know what standards wind you up and what standards would you like to see manufacturers either sticking to or bringing in? Because there's gonna be some. Uh, let's talk about it down there and let's get on with the rest of the show. Okay, so into news, and the first thing in news is the Fazari Signal Peak cross-country bike, which is available in a few different guises. There's, there's an SL version, there's the cross-country version with 100 mil travel, and there's a the trail version, which we're naturally gonna wanna talk about here, uh, with 120 mil travel up front and 115 out back. Uh, this is the frame. I think you'll agree, it looks nice and clean. It looks very simple. A thoroughbred XC bike, actually. I think this is a great looking bike. So full carbon fiber construction on here, four bar design, uh, top tube mounted swing link. You can see there in some of those images. They say frame weight, 1,860 grams. They didn't say the size, but normally it's a size medium that frame manufacturers quote. So available in 100 or 150 mil travel on the rear end, uh, which you would pair up with a 100 mil travel fork or a 120 mil travel fork. Okay, so geometry then, we've got head angle, seat angle, chain state and reach for you here. So head angle, 67 degrees or 68, depending on if you went for the 120 or the 100 mil option. Seat angle, 75 or 74. Of course, 74 degrees, very common in the cross country world, good staple number there. Uh, chain stays, 430 mil for both options there. So 120 mil travel reach numbers are 432, 448, 
466 and 483. Uh, so they're a little bit shorter than the 100 mil, which is essentially the same frame, but it's tipped back, isn't it? So uh, that would shorten your reach. So if you want the longer reach uh, on 100 mil, that is 443, 458, 477 and 494. So quite a healthy reach actually on there. So the frame set retails for 2,499 and complete bills from 3,799 up to 8,999. Okay, next up, uh, Chickadee Hill. Random name this one. So the LFB6 shock. This is it on screen. A new shock from a company I've never heard of. I think this looks great. So it looks a little bit like a DHX2, um, uh, the, the float version that is as you can see here and it's got four-way adjustment on there on the outside so low speed uh, and high speed compression and rebound on there so it has twin positive air chambers on the inside as well as the negative chamber uh, and the damping four-way adjustments so the twin positive what does that do then uh, well essentially it enables them to tune the uh, the second part of the stroke as such so it's going to have a more linear feel throughout the stroke and you can tailor it using that second air chamber uh, kind of reminds me a bit i think of uh, the manitou infinite rate tune system infinite rate adjust really interesting system here uh, so this is it on screen they say uh, the second chamber is effective from about 50% through the travel so I guess then this will feel more like a coil shock initially it's gonna feel quite linear in its action and then you can tailor the way you want it to feel so it should work on a lot of different bike designs as well which is quite cool um, double positive chamber individually adjustable characteristics it's got climb assist as an optional feature on there and it has a uh, tool free damping adjustment on there as well. Uh, don't know too much more about it at this stage, uh, other than this is it, and I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, it looks like it's going to retail for around 1500 euros, though, so uh, not exactly on the cheap side. I'm going to find out a bit more about it and I'll come back to you on this. Uh, I'd like to try one, let's see what they're like, because uh, anyone making shock absorbers is welcome, I think, in a bite scene. I think it's cool challenging the big guns out there. Now, speaking of one of the other big guns, they're doing something a little bit interesting. Mondraker have gone full recyclable with all of their packaging with their bikes. They say zero plastic packaging, no zip ties, no foam on the inside. All the adhesive tape is made from rice, so that is brilliant. The security seal on the box is made from potato pulp. Uh, you should see some packaging shots here. Uh, the, even the adhesives are organic and, and the ink on the, back, on the outside of the box is biodegradable. So the entire lot can just like harmfully uh, turn to nothing. This is just brilliant stuff. The only thing it has on the inside are two reusable Velcro ties, uh, which you can obviously use to hold bits of the bike together on the inside of the box to prevent damage to your lovely new bike that you bought. Uh, but being reusable, they're brilliant for travel. The same thing if you're going to transport your bike anywhere. And let's face it, it's just a useful thing to include. I think this is really cool. Now, there are other bike manufacturers out there starting to do this stuff already. And if you're a bike manufacturer and you're not doing it, come on, get on board. Why would you not? This is all great. It's better for the earth. Okay, next up, Hope's HB916. Have a look at this bad boy. Now, a few, I say a few years ago, I can't even remember when Hope first came out with the concept of their bike, but they make the molds for their bikes themselves in their North England facility, and they make everything about this bike themselves. So it's a really cool project. Of course, they've made that Lotus bike as well on the track world, and they're really sort of making waves in terms of frame production. But this high pivot enduro bike looks to be something special. And although there's no fixed details online about it, the fact they've signed up Hazard Racing, uh, so that is Ferg's and uh, Joe Barnes, as you can see from this post here, uh, says a lot. The bike's gonna start getting out there. So what do we know about it then? So the bike is a carbon front end, it's got an alloy rear end, it's got a high pivot on there, it's coil shock compatible, it's got the idler wheel on there. Uh, I think Joe Barnes's bike, I'm guessing this is his bike, it's got Olin suspension, front and rear. You know that thing is gonna feel so good across the ground. And it's got a 64 degree head angle, and hope so, it's got more progressive geometry than the HB160, which is their current sort of big travel enduro style platform. So these Tech 4 brakes, which you can see in this shot, what do we know about these? Uh, hope so, they've got 30% power increase over the Tech 3. That's quite a lot more power, uh, to be fair. They say genuine bike point and reach adjustment with no tools, direct shift amounts available for SRAM and Shimano there, uh, five axis precision machine from aluminium forged billet, we can guess that because that's what I hope do, reduced friction internal sealing, ball bearing pivots, light lever action for reduced fatigue. 
well, I don't know about you, but I think they look really, really nice. In fact, most of the Hope stuff looks really, really nice. Next up in news, SRAM Hammerhead. So this is an acquisition into the portfolio. So as we know, SRAM originally uh, made some bizarre handlebars and went into move, uh, into gears. And then they acquired the sort of the RockShox part of the portfolio. So they bought suspension in and then they've got Quark. They've got loads of cool stuff in there. They've got zip for wheels in there. You name it, they've got an entire group, so an entire bike OEM spec basically in their portfolio. And this is the latest one, making cycle computers. Now. I'm not the biggest nerd when it comes to cycle computers, but they do have some mega features on, and actually, we need to make some really cool stuff on digital tech, because we use Garmin stuff here, and there's loads of cool stuff on that, I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, but I'm betting money that this computer, which is called the Karoo 2, which, as far as I know, only came out a couple of years ago, it's quite a new, up-to-date, GPS-enabled computer, they're gonna have this working directly with the access system, um, so there's gonna be a whole new bunch of performance things coming down the line, I'm sure of it. They said basically it's business as usual for the time being, but well, they would say that, wouldn't they? I think it's going to have loads of good stuff. But something in the small print on the press release that does impress me, uh, well, at least just makes me give them a sort of nod of approval, is they say that um, it will seamlessly work with SRAM access components and also Shimano electronic shifting and components. That's a good thing. That means SRAM are being inclusive. They're allowing it to work with Shimano. That is very cool. Uh, so watch this space, because I think there's gonna be some really good developments coming with that partnership down the line. And way to go, SRAM. You've gone from being the tiniest little company that challenged Shimano in the biggest story of David versus Goliath ever in the bike industry, and you won. And you've built an amazing portfolio of stuff. I love what you're doing. I love the fact you still manage to feel really young and fresh. Great stuff. Good work, congratulations. And moving on, last one in news. This is just tall porn. What else can I say? Look at this on screen. 3D printed or additive manufactured tools from Silica. Oh my God, look at that chain whip. That is just rude. That thing is so nice. I want that so much in my life. I don't need it in any way. I've got two great chain whips over there that work, but man, do I want one, especially this one, which as far as I know, yeah, for 163 quid in the UK, you can personalize it as well. Mm, I really, really want one. Mega nice, oh man. Not exactly cheap though. All right, come on, hit me up. Anyone out there seen a nicer, cool bike related tool recently? If you have, share it. And then we can have a look at some of the coolest tools out there. Come on, who doesn't like a nice bike tool? Or is it just me? I love it. Okay, quiz time. Three questions coming at you on the screen. Uh, all loosely bike and tech related. Um, first question coming at you right now. What was Hope Technologies' first product? Question two, Pharrell Williams. Yeah, that Pharrell Williams. Nothing to do with mountain biking. Pharrell Williams is a singer, a super cool, famous dude, is associated with a bike brand. Which bike brand? And lastly, some newer Manitou suspension forks have a feature called IRT built into them. What does that stand for and what does it do? We'll pick up the answers a bit later. Okay, comments time. And we were talking about just some of the best looking bikes and the coolest looking bikes out there. There's some great comments um, and a few alternative ones I've chucked in here as well this week. First from Oakley Payne Mayer, the Antelope Carbon Jack looks simply amazing. Just look at it in raw carbon with the gloss finish. The same goes for the Uno Ever. Oh, dude, yeah, what a bike. Completely agree with you, I think I said it on the show. Uh, the finish on that is absolutely beautiful. The Uno Ever, great shout. You say, I simply love bikes that have those aggressive lines of slender top tubes. Mondraker, Uno, Prime, and Antidote are the best looking bikes in my opinion. Um, yeah, I completely agree with you. And yeah, that slender top tube, there's something about it. Now, I'm not sure who did it first, but I really remember Mondraker doing it on the Foxy Carbon from, I don't know, 2016, uh, 2014. 2015, I completely lose track. I used to have one, I should know these things. Uh, I've ridden so many bikes, I forget sometimes. Uh, but yeah, that, that lovely line that goes straight into the seat stays. If you can make that line on a bike work, it just looks beautiful and uh, lovely stuff. Mark Orico, best looking 2021 Evil Insurgent. I might be biased though as I own one. Hey, well, that tells me a lot about how much you like it. That's no bad thing, is it, if you own one? And there's something about Evil. They're one of those brands that have, you know, the thing. You know what it is? They've just got the, the thing. Uh, next comments from Get Out and Ride MTB. Why is it that downhill racers like to run tubeless tires? Okay, this is a question. Um, but free riders and other pros like in Rampage seem to use tubes. 
Okay, well, downhill, one of the biggest factors about it is trying to get traction, you know, trying to keep your wheels on the ground for traction. If you're sliding, you're not, you're not covering ground correctly or as efficiently as you can be. Uh, so tire pressure is one of the single biggest things you can do in addition to your suspension to keep those wheels on the ground. So running a tubeless system enables you to run pressures and enable the tires to conform. Uh, tubeless is just really efficient and effective. Don't get me wrong, not all downhill racers use a tubeless system, but it's very common. Whereas in things like Rampage, a uh, great example here, it's all about keeping your tires on the rim. Uh, they won't be running sort of, you know, 20s in pressure. They'll be running 30s at least because uh, it's all about landing massive jumps where you're putting all the strain into the bike. Many of them will be running suspension with very firm compression tunes on there to really soak up those landings. And they'll be running the tires as firm as possible to stop them blowing off the rims, uh, essentially. Which, if you run over a certain pressure, let's say it's 35 or 40 PSI with... Um, tubeless tires, you risk exactly that. Laying hard from a jump, you can tear a tire off the rim because it's not intended to be run at pressures like that. It's part of a system to run at a lower pressure. Whereas in the tubes, you can run tires at extremely high pressures, even higher than the tire recommends, and it's gonna stay on the rim, at least a lot better and a lot safer, which that's why they're using them in Rampage. Uh, next up, back to the coolest bikes, uh, Liquid, Liquid 1337, the coolest looking bike, Santa Cruz V10 in Oxblood. I wouldn't have put the Santa Cruz up there, but that, it does, you're right, it does look really good in that colour, just look, got it on screen. The Oxblood is a great colour. Hey, do you remember they did that, uh, that crazy, it was almost pink colour, called it Klaxomoto. Am I right in thinking that that's pretty much a, a red wine spritzer in Spain or Portugal or something? I'm pretty sure I've read that. It's uh, basically Coca-Cola and red wine. If so, I think I like that even more. Uh, next up is from Bugboy152000. The best looking bike has to be the Bold Lincoln. Sleek, clean and fast. Best looking bike I've ever seen. To be honest, most of the stuff that Bold are doing, doing most of the stuff that Bold are doing uh, is exceptionally nice. I'll agree with you there. Um, I can't even think what the Lincoln is off the top of my head, but Bold bikes are stunning in their approach. Uh, and now they work with Scott means, of course, Scott are capitalizing on that as well. Uh, Shafiq Jan says, my BMW TMX, my high pivot mullet, has been running strong since I got it in 95 or 96. Oh my God, I'm so pleased that someone watching the show has got one. So that's a Brooklyn Machine Works THX. Those things weighed, I don't know, what, 60 pounds or something insane? Please, Shafiq, if you've got a shot of it that you're willing to share, please send it in uh, into like Top Mods or Rewind or something like that. Please, as many pictures as you can. I'd love to feature it on the show because those old Brooklyn Machine Works bikes are bonkers. They are so cool as well. Okay, now it's time for top mods. Don't forget this is all about you sending in uh, shots of your bike or video clips of your bike and what you've done to it to make it better. It could be your bike, it could be your dad's bike, it could be your mum's bike, your wife's bike, your husband's bike, your son's bike, your daughter's bike. Any bikes that you fixed up and made better, we want to see them. So there's a link right there to the uploader. Uh, please get involved with it. Now I do notice that some of you said you'd had problems with the uploader. I spoke to our guys internally. We've checked it on all systems and it is working. So I can only think some of you might be having issues with like ad blockers and things like that. Um, let us know if you are still so we can try and figure out what the issues are because we want to see the great stuff from you lot. Now, it doesn't get much better than this first shot. So this is Chris in California. He says, Dad built my bike. I've got two older brothers, two older sisters, and we all love riding as a family. Look at a bike. This is so sick. What a cool bike. So your dad's obviously got access to a load of cool stickers. So I'm guessing your dad might be riding a specialized bike because you've got some specialized stickers on there. But look at the forks. You've got these little dilly suspension forks and they've got little RockShox stickers on them. Super cool. The frame's got S-Works and Specialized on there. You've even got some proper lights on the top there and a full face helmet as well. Ah, oh, Chris, dude, what a cool little bike. 16 inch full sus S works. Man, what a cool thing to see. Uh, little, what tires are they? Are they V tires, little tan walls as well. Oh man, I would have absolutely loved a bike like that when I was little. So this is Marvin in Virginia, US in Blacksburg. And he's got winterized and now personalized 2017 Salsa Timberjack. So that's a great frame. So arguably you don't really need to do anything to it anyway. Uh, but here it is in winter spec mode. Great big fat tires on there. It looks like a mud hugger, mud guard combo front and rear, but it looks fit for doing miles in foul conditions. Like decent setup on there. Uh, you say, Donnie, thanks for your ever positive attitude and regular encouragement to ride the bikes we have. 
In that spirit, I wanted to share pictures of my project to upgrade and personalize my beloved South Timberjack, uh, which is my winter trail bike. I tried my level best at a professional paint job and fell short in many ways, uh, but I've come to appreciate that the goal is to make the bike mine rather than to make it perfect. Hey, that is, that is such an important thing. I think people get carried away with stuff. It's your bike, it's not anyone else's. It's you that's gotta love the thing, and you gotta love riding it. So, so this is awesome, but taking on a paint job, hats off to anyone that does, to be fair. Went for the custom frame, done a custom frame bag for future bike packing adventures as well. So there's the frame, oh wow, okay. So going to full stripped down spec there, and there it is in its glory as a bare frame. This is when things start getting nervous, I bet. So you're getting your primer on there. Like your little booth area. Oh man, you've done some decent graphics on there too. Hey, that is some serious work. Hey, that looks awesome. You call it lumberjack, I like it. <laughs> awesome stuff. Oh man, do you know, uh, it's hard to say because some things look good from afar, but they might be far from good, but that looks excellent, dude. That looks really good. That could be like a stock bike out of catalog, uh, except for a custom top tube graphic. I think this is one of my favorites actually, Marvin. I think you've done a great job on this. It genuinely looks like an off the shelf job. And you say like it's harder than you think and it doesn't look perfect up close, but hey, doesn't matter. Anyone that sees you riding that is gonna think it is an awesome looking bike. And that's all that counts really. Uh, more so if you love riding it. So well done on that and great stuff. Thank you for sending your top mods in. Okay, and to finish off the show, let's just have some quiz answers, shall we? So, first question was, what was Hope Technologies' first product? Some of you might have said hubs, but actually it was a disc brake. They made a cable-operated disc brake, uh, which used a bit of a bizarre system. The disc, as far as I remember, I had a friend called Paul Miller, and sometimes watches this show. Um, he runs a specialised store in Ricelip, actually. It used to be a shop called Action Bikes. Anyhow, long story, he had one of these on the front of his bike, and it clamped onto his pace fork that he was using at the time, and he used the screw-on system on a hub to mount the disc rotor if that makes sense. Uh, it was kind of an interesting concept and the brake worked pretty well, uh, but they soon went from that to developing a better system for mounting discs uh, by designing hubs, um, and they went that way. But very cool stuff from Hope. Next question was Pharrell Williams. Yep, that Pharrell Williams uh, is associated with a bike brand. Which one? BMW, Brooklyn Machine Works. Uh, he's one of the co-owners of the brand, uh, which is super ridiculously cool for a bike brand to be associated with someone like him. Uh, and here's a shot of him from their Instagram page. Uh, if you want to follow them, give them a follow because they are a very cool bike brand. Even though they're not making those crazy full sus bikes anymore, they still have that thing about them. Okay, and the last one was some newer Manatee suspension forks have got a feature called IRT uh, built into them. What does it stand for and what does it do? It stands for Infinite Rate Tune. And it's essentially a system built into the fork, kind of like a third air chamber, uh, that enables you to tune infinitely uh, the rate at which the fork progressively gets firmer towards the end of travel. Well, it's a similar concept, arguably, to using air volume spacers uh, to change the way that the fork characteristics uh, change, or the shock characteristics change throughout the travel. Um, obviously, air in a compressed chamber is gonna get uh, more progressive naturally, but you can further change that by decreasing the size of the air chamber. Uh, and on the Manitou forks, with the IRT system on it, you can infinitely change it, and it can arguably be a smoother ramp as well than you can get with using air volume spacers. So very cool stuff from Manitou. Uh, and that's the end of this week's show. Hopefully you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week. See you later.